This is Andrew Sullivan's piece yesterday. And actually, Zach, could you show the, the screenshot I sent of his tweet? And then could you enlarge? So this is a quote from, uh, boy. I can read it. You want me to read yeah, it? Yeah, would you read it? So what am I reading, though? Is, is the this whole Andrew thing. Sullivan? I yeah, just, this is Andrew Sullivan. This is a quote is from this? Andrew okay. Sullivan. <clears throat> this is Andrew Sullivan in his piece posted yesterday. And this seems to me to be the key question here. Do we really want to get back to living? I do. So take the rational precautions, a solid vaccine, and go about your business as you always did. Yes, I'll wear a mask indoors if I'm legally required or politely asked. But I don't really see why anyone should. In a free society, once everyone has access to a vaccine that overwhelmingly prevents serious sickness and death, there is no reason to enforce lockdowns again, or mask mandates, or social distancing any longer. In fact, there's every reason not to. So what I wanted to say, and I uh, this is offered with um, full respect, Andrew. I really like a lot of what you say. And frankly, I understand and resonate with the point that you are making here. I get it. But I don't think it's right because it's predicated on a couple of things that aren't accurate. Uh, so you are imagining that you are being asked, the CDC yesterday or the day before said that it wanted people who had been vaccinated to wear masks. Why? That's the question. Now, the answer that many people are arriving at, the answer that I believe we are being led to, is that you are wearing them to protect unvaccinated people. And there is a degree of truth in your wearing a mask protects unvaccinated people. But I think the clearest reason why you are being asked to wear a mask is to protect you, a vaccinated person, from the escape variants that we now see circulating. And secondly, from, uh, do you want to jump? Um the first reason for you to wear a mask as a vaccinated person is to protect you against the escape variants, which are on the rise and about which the vaccines with which you've already been vaccinated are very little protection. Are very little protection, which points to selection exerted by those vaccines on the virus. So we are ultimately going to find ourselves in an argument about evolutionarily why we are seeing variants now what their implication is but the fact that those variants are good at creating breakthrough cases among the vaccinated implies selection by those vaccines has produced these variants that's one reason that you need to be protected at this moment more than the cdc recognized you did a month ago the second reason has to do with the fading of the immunity from the vaccines so these vaccines, it turns out, not only do they provide a narrow immunity, but they also provide a short-lived immunity that appears to fade. So, in, oh, go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> well, I thought you wanted to show this evidence as well as your third reason. Yeah, there's, okay. a, and I was going to say okay. there is there is also a third reason. So in your piece, Andrew, you repeat a piece of wisdom that has been almost universally embraced. And this piece of wisdom is the vaccines protect you from getting an infection. They are not perfect. They also protect you from getting sick, protect you from getting very sick if you do contract a breakthrough infection. Now, what we want to call your attention to is a piece that emerged two days ago. Yeah, two or three. Two or three days ago on Substack uh, by a creature euphemistically called Wait, oh, okay um I, what? zach showed my screen when i was not ready for it to be shown that's all right okay um, this was published by dr roller gator who i should point out is not actually a phd as far as i know he's also not an actual alligator and his leather jacket is fake but his analysis this is a person who has published a very serious analysis of the so this is a person you know to be a real person yes an alligator i do know him to be a, part, a person uh and a ferociously high quality intellect yeah, um, but anyway he has a uh, an ironic personality on twitter which he is using for his Substack as well in any case, it is an analysis of the question of the benefits of the vaccines. And what he posits here, based on a thorough mathematical analysis that appears to us at least to be robust, is a, the question about what the vaccines do in the case of breakthrough cases. Do they reduce the likelihood of getting seriously ill? 
So if I could have my screen back for a minute, Zach, I was just looking something up. Um, what he is, if I can just, I'm just going to read the section here rather than us. Yeah. Um, so in, this is this is now from our piece that we published yesterday, the little bit of it in which we are talking about his. Um, in this off-sided study, um, which is Haas et al. 2021, looking at the effectiveness of the two-dose Pfizer vaccine in Israel, they purport to find extremely high effectiveness against both infections and in breakthrough cases in reducing hospitalizations, severe disease, and death. And that, that is the work that has been transmuted into the, into the mainstream media and the, largely the reason why um, people um, who are vaccinated feel safe um, not just against getting the disease once they're vaccinated, but um, in having a reduced um, a reduced case of it should they get a breakthrough case. Um, but but Dr. Rollergator here provides an analysis uh, in which he finds um, that it is true that um, the risk of infection is far lower in vaccinated than in unvaccinated individuals. However, if a person is both vaccinated and infected, the correct math reveals no reduction in deaths compared to being unvaccinated, and um, unless you are old. And with regard to hospitalizations, there is a tiny reduction in hospitalization for the uh, 45 to 64 year olds and a larger reduction for the old, um, but for people under 45, um, again, no reduction at all. And so let's just show his, his graphs here. This is with regard, to, with regard to death, the probability of COVID-19 related death if infected for ages 16 to 14. Um, basically the, um, the confidence interval, I, think this is, I'm not remembering, um, is much broader for the vaccinated, but um, but they're effectively the same thing. And that is to say their their mean is the same. Yep. And um, for, uh, hold on, so that was 16 to 44 year olds. Uh, for 45 to 64 year olds, there is a you know, it looks like a slightly higher rate of death if you're vaccinated, but really the, you know, the numbers are, are, are sloppy enough that there's no reason to think that that is true. Um, but that there's certainly no protective effect um, if you get a breakthrough case. Um, but that's, but that flips um, for the, for the old, for 65 years and older people, you do indeed have both, and this is just deaths, and I'm not going to scroll through and find the hospitalization um, graphs that that he has produced here. Um, but if you're over 65 and you get a breakthrough case uh, because you're vaccinated, but you get exposed to COVID and you get a breakthrough case, um, being vaccinated does um, does predict a better outcome with regard to you not dying and you not being hospitalized. But for people younger than that, um, that pattern falls apart. Right. So uh, let's say this work has just emerged. It will be interesting to see if anyone finds a flaw in it. But the basic point that uh, that this paper makes is that, in fact, what we are being given is something like a sales pitch in which the reduction in deaths and hospitals. Which paper? Relegator's paper? Yes. Relegator's giving a sales pitch? No. He is alleging that we are being given a sales pitch. Okay. And the sales pitch is that you have a reduced likelihood of infection a reduced likelihood of severe disease and a reduced likelihood of hospitalization and death, when in fact those are the same reduction. That is to say, if you don't get COVID, you obviously won't go to the hospital for COVID and you won't die of COVID. But it is not that if you get an infection, you also have a much reduced likelihood of these things. You don't unless you're in this very old age group. Right, exactly. So, uh, you know, effectively, then the way that the numbers were analyzed um, amounts to either. Um, just a, a naive misunderstanding of how they should have been analyzed or hopefully not uh, an in, intentional uh, erroneous signal put into the world. Right. But but I think the, the point about uh, Andrew Sullivan's piece is that mm -hmm. you can see even in that quote that we read that what he is imagining is that he's going to go about his life and if he gets a case, it's going to be much reduced. And so why should he be wearing a mask? And the answer is A, because your likelihood of getting a case is going up as a result of the fading of the vaccine immunity, as a result of the narrowness of that immunity and the variants that are now uh, increasingly dominating the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And the benefit that he's imagining should he get a case is likely to be uh, close to non-existent if this analysis is correct. Yeah. 
He's, so, he's, not, he's not elderly. Right. So I guess the sum total of all of this, the way I would sum it up is I believe we have to recognize that we have been given a bunch of intuitive sounding wrong things that many people believe, right? We are facing increasing frustration. And in fact, I believe we can see an orchestrated campaign to blame the unvaccinated for the continuing pandemic, as if there was ever a plan in which these vaccines were going to end the pandemic, which is inconceivable in light of the fact that even if you were to vaccinate all of the Western world, you couldn't reach the entire world with these things, which meant there was going to be large populations that were going to continue to have this virus. So well, you needed effectively sterilizing vaccines that were rolled out simultaneously everywhere. And, um, and you know, I'm, I hope that um, we all wish that we had sterilizing vaccines. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, we you know, arrived at the pandemic with the vaccines that showed up sort of, um, and, you know, still hoping for, you know, good, solid sterilizing vaccines to show up. That would be great. Um, but also the way that these vaccines were rolled out, at least in the U.S., was very slow. And if, you know, you will remember it was, you know, it's healthcare. There were all these tiers. It was healthcare workers first and the elderly and people with comorbidities and people were, were you know, vying to to break rank and, and get vaccinated early, but there just wasn't enough to go around. And had the goal been to eradicate the virus and stop the pandemic, there would have been a concerted effort to to wait until there was enough vaccine supply and concentrate the vaccine rollout so that as many people as possible got vaccinated all at once, as opposed to providing this sort of rolling target for a selection to act on. Right. And so you can imagine, if, like if we really had non-corrupt, highly competent public health authorities, you would imagine that as painful as it would be to delay vaccination, because of course there would be lives lost in the interim, that there would have been a delay to allow a sudden uh, deployment of the vaccines uh, universally. Um, there would have been special guidance around how to behave while you were developing immunity. So even in the mm -hmm. case of a sterilizing vaccine, the period of time in which you're developing immunity is a hazard. So, you know, you know, we well, can, I did see. I mean, that I, the, the guidance was until you are considered fully immunized, which was uh, two weeks after your final um, shot, if you got the two shot uh, vaccine, you need to behave as if you're not. Well, but behave as if you're not doesn't doesn't begin to cover it. Okay. Um, so my point is, we could have really high quality guidance and the really high quality guy, we could have really high quality vaccines. Maybe that's harder to get to. Yeah, I'm not. We don't know. We don't know. But we, we should we should certainly we hope that there is R&D um, under un, going on right now for high quality sterilizing vaccines would be lovely. Yes. But it would also be lovely to imagine that there's not going to be a fight between manufacturers sure. over whose vaccine has the market and that that fight is going to have very little to do with which vaccines are best for humanity. Yeah. I, I hate to say it. That may sound cynical. But given what I've seen, uh, I, I would expect a jockeying for position. About, Pandemic profiteering. Right. Right. Pandemic profiteering is what I was expe would expect. But you could imagine very brief guidance, right, that you would get vaccinated, you would coordinate with uh, your family maybe and, you know, isolate completely for some period of time. I, I don't know what the we, we would really want high quality analysis, um, but you could imagine a campaign. But this campaign does not look like it was designed in any way that anyone could have imagined it was going to end the pandemic. And yet that's kind of been the implication that we would have ended the pandemic if only it weren't for the holdouts. And that's yeah. just nonsense. It's, it can't be right. 